Um, okay, so our next speaker now is uh, going to be Dr. Uh, John Fobajong, who is a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and past lecturer of governance and economics at the U.S. Naval War College. He served as director of leadership and civic engagement uh, program at UMass and is the current director of the public administration <laughs> program at the university. He's taught courses in American government, African politics, public administration, international relations, and civil rights at several universities in the U.S. He's also uh, the author of a number of scholarly books and peer-reviewed articles uh, and uh, was a U.S. Uh, Fulbright Fellow in 2009-10. Outside of his scholarly activities, Professor Fobajang is president of the Kids of Tomorrow Orphanage, located in Nigeria, which provides housing, food, and education to children displaced as a result of the loss of parents in the war in Cameroon. He, uh, Professor Fobajang was born in Cameroon and immigrated to the U.S. in 1980. Prior to immigrating, um, he worked as an intelligence officer at the Delegation for national security in Cameroon and later assistant police commissioner at the Douala International Airport. Today he will be speaking on enduring factors responsible for the epidemic of genocide in Africa. Let's all welcome Dr. John Fobijan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, I would like to start by thanking the authorities of PCC, the organizers of this conference, for finally placing Africa on the map. Um, there's no continent that has contributed more to the West. There's no continent that has con con contributed more to the growth, to the rise of the West than Africa. When the West partnered with Africa in the 1400, it allowed the West to leapfrog and overtake the Ottoman Empire and overtake China. Without Africa, I do not think that the West would be the hegemony that it is today, the great, great number one region in the world that it is today. May I also take time out to thank our host. By our host, I mean our Native American ancestors, those that welcomed us here and gave us with open heart, open arms, this rich land that has brought prosperity to most everyone in the world. Thank you, thank you. Um, now, my presentation is about the bigger picture. Um, conditions that perpetuate genocide in Africa. Now, um, the UN, in 1944, finally describes genocide as um, a crime that is committed with intent to destroy a people because of their identity. Now, uh, oftentimes we wonder, what, what makes genocide? Is it the number killed or the intent? Uh, Kofi Annan, after the Rwandan genocide, was called upon to address this controversy. And he said, what makes genocide is not so much the number, it's the intent. So even if the, in, in the Rwanda genocide, even if just one person was killed, and the intent was to destroy uh, the Tutsis, that constituted genocide. In the Jewish uh, Holocaust, even if just one Jewish person, not six million, just one killed, and the intent was to eliminate Jews, that would constitute genocide. Now, on Africa, for us to properly understand and see what genocide has done for Africa, I've gone through and listed a, li a documented, it's on there, okay. I can't see it, okay. Uh, docu documented cases of genocide on the continent of Africa. And it goes back to way, way, long before independence. Uh, it begins with the extermination of the uh, Herara people in uh, na uh, Southwest Africa. Um, Herara and the Name people. This, I can't see my screen here. Um, it led, it's perpetrated by, by, by Germany, by the Germans, and uh, it led to the elimination of 80% of the Hereras 
and 65,000 of the Hereros and 10,000 of uh, Nama, the, the Namas. And this was in 1904. Um, the French uh, in Algeria, genocide, um, what led to the killing of one million Algerians. Then in Rwanda, before the 1994 genocide, there was an earlier genocide. This was in 1954, between 1954 and 1962, and it brought, it caused the death of, what, um, 10,000 Tutsis. And then a second, the second Rwanda genocide, where our, guest, our keynote speaker just um, gave us a talk on, that brought about you know, the killings of between 800 and a million uh, victims. And then the Ikeza genocide. This was in Burundi in 1972. It brought, you know, an end, uh, it caused the death of 200,000 Burundis, um, Hutus in Burundi. And then um, in the DRC, um, between 1885 and 1908, uh, in the genocide um, that was perpetuated by King Leopold of Belgium, that brought about you know, the death of between what, 10 million and 15 million Congolese. And then in what historians, modern his historians refer to as the first African, the Africa's first world war, um, which was an insurgen insurgency that you had about four countries Rwanda, Angola, Zimbabwe, um, Congo, um, Uganda, and even Kenya. They all sent troops. And they, it's between 1996 and 1999, uh, it led to the death of between five and six million Congolese. And it continues. And then uh, in 1967, uh, I'm sorry, in, in 19, not 1967, okay, yes. In 1967, the Biafra war in Nigeria led to the death of close to a million Igbos, uh, Igbos of Eastern Nigeria. And then um, in Kenya, in 19, what, 1960, the Mau Mau genocide, uh, perpetrators, the British, uh, brought to, you know, caused the death of close to 90,000 Kenyans. Then you had the extermination of the San people in Southern Africa, uh, where the Dutch, Dutch settlers, perpetrated by the Dutch, Dutch settlers, that led to the complete extinction, to, to, to the near extinction of the San people who are also referred to as the Bush, the Bush, the Bush men. Uh, that this was between 1870 and 1936. And then the Matebela War, our earlier speaker just talked about that. This was in uh, Zimbabwe, which at the time was called uh, Southern, Southern Rhodesia. Um, it led to the killings of hundreds of thousands of people, un unspecified of course. And then, um, then in Cameroon, uh, between 1959 and 1964, there was a genocide perpetrated by the French that led to the killings of close to 400,000 Bamile case. Uh, then, as we speak, there's an ongoing genocide in Cameroon. Uh, it's called the Ambazonian Genocide. So far, close to 55,000 people have been killed. The war started in, what, actually 2000, what, 2017, and it's ongoing. Now, um, what distinguishes African genocide from genocides in other parts of the world? Um, African genocides, what's unique about them is that uh, most, most, of the, most of them were committed by external forces, external powers, uh, mostly uh, during the European conquest, European global expansion. You see here Germany, 
France, Britain, Spain, um, in the quest to spread out and acquire territories beyond Europe, um, it came with violence. That violence in Africa, in Namibia, uh, led to the extinction of ethnic. And then you have in 1944, um, before 1944, acts of genocide existed in Africa, but the term genocide did not exist. Um, so can we, how do you pr prosecute a crime that has no name? Um, and so, um, because the term genocide did not exist before 1944, most of the genocides that occurred, that happened before that period, before World War II in Africa, went unprosecuted. Why? Because it had no name. Now, um, luckily, um, most unprosecuted genocides um, would have headed to oblivion, that means unknown in history. Luckily, in 1944, a Jewish Polish lawyer called Raphael Lemkin um, at the UN came up with this new terminology, with this new phrase, this new word, it's called genocide, which is a compound word. Geno comes from people, inside killing. So combined, genocide gave meaning to this crime that existed in Africa long before colonial rule, uh, long before Europeans came. So as, as much as most of modern genocide in Africa were perpetrated by outsiders, uh, before colonial rule, there were a um, series of genocides that occurred, but because they had no names, uh, they went undocumented, they went unprosecuted, but this lawyer uh, finally brought a name, and with that name, historians have now documented and are now documenting cases of genocide that go back to actually prehistoric times. And then, um, moral appeals against genocide. Um, genocide in Africa has been an epidemic going back to pre-1944. Uh, despite appeals, moral appeals from Bishop Desmond Tutu, who made the statement, who said here that um, if you are silent in situations of injustice, you have chosen sides with oppressor. If you are silent in situations of injustice, you've taken sides with the oppressor. Um, he made this statement during the fight for freedom in South Africa in case uh, against apartheid. Um, most of the West at the time remained uh, neutral. They remained silent, and so he made an appeal. He gave speeches across Europe and across North America, calling on the West to intervene forcefully to end uh, apartheid and to end the killings in Africa. And then before him, uh, around the 1800s, uh, an English philosopher, John Stuart Mill, also made an appeal where he said the only thing necessary for, for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Uh, he made this in the face of mass killings that were going on in Europe, uh, in the face of uh, Catholic, Protestant wars that were going on in Europe, and uh, there was the tendency initially to remain neutral, uh, but he made that appeal, and uh, eventually um, uh, authorities and governments stepped forward and uh, took action that brought end to some of these conflicts. And then, uh, in modern times, in the 1960s, we had Martin Luther King, who uh, uh, made this appeal where he said, uh, uh, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Um, a moral appeal uh, for Americans of all uh, hues to stand up, join hands, join forces with African Americans who are fighting for freedom, who are fighting to end the persecution that was uh, fought against African Americans. Um, then you had the UN um, uh, during, in, uh, in the 1940s, 44, um, when the UN, in one of the most important decisions that were t taken by the UN um, was the creation of a human, a human, a human rights organization. 
uh, to um, and the, the pledge that was used in the creation of this human rights organization was what we call the never again pledge. The never again pledge. Uh, the world looked back at um, what happened um, in Germany. Uh, looked back with shame and uh, uh, guilt at what was done to Jewish people in Germany. And the international community gathered and came up and declared that never again shall we remain silent as another people in the world suffers genocide. Now, um, the sources and causes of genocide in Africa. So we know that geno of genocide has become, it is a, an epidemic in Africa. It, it existed long before colonial rule. It's ongoing, as we speak. It is happening in Cameroon. It is happening in Eastern Congo. And it's happening in the Sudan. So what are the causes? What are these sources? Um, we'll go back, we'll look at, uh, it began in the 1844s, in the 1880s actually, uh, with the scramble for Africa, where there was this uh, rush to acquire territories and colonial territories on the continent. Um, the result to genocide in Africa was done as a means to an end. It means to an end because in Europe, there was an intra-European rivalry to become number one. There was conflict between the, the, Spain, uh, the Spanish, uh, the, the Portuguese, the French, the British, the Germans competing in Europe to become number one. In that competition, Europeans saw it fit to extend their influence beyond Europe and acquire resources and, in, and territories that will increase their power, that will increase their, 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 their ability to um, overcome and uh, uh, win conflicts against other European powers. Now, so in this quest to acquire colonies in Africa, there was balkanization, the forceful division of African countries into ethnic groups, into uh, territories. Um, in this process, um, you, brought, you saw ethnic groups that were brought together under one state, ethnic groups that had nothing in common, that had, prior to colonial times, had nothing in common, no. And so they were forcibly grouped together. And in grouping them together, it, it, it fueled conflict in tensions, and these tensions in places like Nigeria led to a civil, the 1966 civil war. And then you had uh, competition for resources in Africa. Uh, minerals, oil, farmland, grazing land, uh, there is a, a, a concept in political science, it's called the, the, the resource curse. Wherever you find resources in abundance, that generally sometimes would lead to conflict, would uh, provoke conflict. So um, whereas resources should be a blessing, should you know, lead to wealth, as we see in northern, in, uh, northern Europe, Norway has oil, but, and oil has brought wealth and prosperity, but in Africa, Resources, unfortunately, have brought a curse. And so political scientists came up with this phrase, it's called uh, the resource curse, uh, where uh, in most every country in Africa we, where you find genocide, where you've had gen genocide or war, ongoing war, uh, you find a rich abundance of resources. Congo is a, a good example. And then uh, religious fundamentalism. That too is another cause for uh, genocide in Africa. You have Boko Haram, the Lost Resistance Army, uh, who, for religious reasons, are killing and abducting and kidnapping, and uh, uh, in the name of uh, religion. Then you have um, ethnic rivalry in countries like Rwanda, Burundi, and uh, Nigeria. Then imperially driven racism. Uh, I talked earlier about the Sun people, um, the Her Herero. Uh, people and the Nama people. As recently as in 1936, uh, in Botswana, there were licenses, hunting licenses, given to tourists who were flying in to Rwanda to go hunt down the sand people, to go and kill you know, the government in Botswana, in Southwest Africa, actually issued, issued licenses 
to people who are flying as tourists to you know, take girls, go in and shoot down the sun people. Then um, that's what I mean here by imperially driven racism. Then uh, Western disregard for African lives. Western disregard for African lives. I compare here, I look here at the Bosnia War in uh, 1993, 1994, and the Rwandan uh, genocide. These two crises were going on around the same time. But the US and the West they intervened in, in, uh, in uh, Botswana in the, uh, and brought an end to the conflict in Botswana, in, uh, in uh, Bosnia. Uh, but paid no attention to the conflict that was going on in Rwanda. So this seen as uh, Western disregard, uh, apparently, for Rwandan lives were not as important as Bo Bosnian lives. And then another uh, ongoing case is that of Southern Cameroons and the war in Ukraine. There's an ongoing war in Southern Cameroons, in, uh, in Cameroon, between the Anglophones and the Francophones. The war has been on since 2017, and the West has not done much to intervene or to call for an end to the conflict. But the war in Ukraine um, broke out just last year, and the West has poured at pumping resources. Then um, another reason why um, genocide in Africa has become an epidemic and is ongoing is because um, you, uh, UN penalty for genocide is too lenient to deter genocide. Too lenient. And what's the penalty? The penalty is, uh, according to UN uh, uh, resolution, the law says whoever directly and whoever directly and publicly in incites another to violate subsection A shall be fined not more than $500,000 or imprisoned for not more than five years. That's the penalty for genocide, $500,000. So if you cause genocide, if you kill 800,000 people, if you kill five, uh, 1 million people, the most you can get in conviction will be $500,000 fine or five years in prison. That's too lenient a penalty to deter genocide. Um, so uh, impunity breeds recidivism. Uh, if the penalty is too lenient or if the, penalty, if the crime goes without punishment, then there's the likelihood that it will breed recidivism. It will cause a repeat in uh, the crime. Uh, we saw here in Cameroon, there was a genocide in the 1960s. Because that genocide went unreported, unpunished, uh, uh, there is a repeat in that genocide. There is an ongoing genocide now, which is a second genocide in Cameroon. And uh, of course, there is also what you call victor's justice. Uh, parties that win conflicts are not punished for crimes they committed during that conflict. Um, had Germany won World War II, they would not have persecuted the perpetrators of the Holocaust. Um, luckily, the West won, and we, of course, persecuted the perpetrators. And so, for genocide to be punished, we've got to make sure that the idea of Victor's, genesis, uh, Victor's justice uh, is uh, re revisited. Then, now, um, as, as alarming as genocide is, uh, US, the US has been reluctant in ratifying the Genocide Convention. It concerns that ratification would, inf the US, it took a lot of uh, campaigning and uh, a lot of pressure for the US to finally ratify the, gen uh, the, uh, the, gen the Genocide Convention. It wasn't until 1988, and this convention was passed in 1944. It took more than 44 years for the US to finally uh, ratify this con uh, convention. Uh, it came as a result of pressure from a US Congress, uh, Congressman, Senator William Proxmire. He gave as many as 3,000 speeches on the floor of Congress. And that was what finally got uh, put pressure on the US government to ratify the uh, 
Genocide Convention. Now, uh, depicting uh, King Leopold's ghastly exploits. Um, the Eastern Congo, Congo in, in general, uh, since Congo became independent, this country has never seen a decade of peace. Uh, we saw earlier that as many as 10 million people were killed during colonial times, and with independence in 1960, the killings continue, six, between five, six million people so far. So during uh, the era of uh, King Leopold, uh, genocide came in the form of rape. Uh, this is uh, uh, possibly a colonist who just came from raping this little girl, and apparently he, he holds her up as a trophy, as a trophy more or less. Then here's uh, some villager whose hand got chopped off by uh, some Belgian colonists. And then uh, mutilation. Genocide came in the form of mutilation. This uh, are young people who apparently either refused to work or did not want to be subjected to um, colonial rule. Their fingers, their hands were amputated, uh, chopped off, mm -hmm. and then, of course, um, mass dis dis displacement. Uh, groups of villagers driven away from their village and some killed and forcibly removed from lands that were fertile. Then, of course. Um, so that's uh, the face of genocide in Africa. It is an epidemic, an epidemic that uh, um, can only come to an end if conferences like this, if institutions like this stand up and invite and bring uh, awareness to the, to the world and to the international community. Thank you.